We are in Colossians chapter 2. When I teach for Steve, I, I've been teaching through a book, and so we got to Colossians. I've, I've done a couple studies in it, and so we're in chapter 2. Colossians is a book that Paul wrote to the church at uh, Colossae. Uh, he had this awesome opportunity to encourage them to just put Jesus first. You know, it's pretty simple. It's pretty amazing um, how simple it is to follow Jesus. Notice I didn't say easy. It is simple. And it's four short chapters on this, um, on the topic of Jesus is everything. Get that straight in your life. And then because he's everything in your life, all the other things will fall into place. That's pretty awesome. And matter of fact, Paul says you need to read this letter to the church at Laodicea because they need to hear what um, I have said to you. And then actually, Paul wrote a letter to Laodicea. And later on in Colossians, he says, read that letter also. We don't have that letter, but I think I know what it says. I think it says, stop it, basically. Because if you look at what went on at Laodicea in the book of Revelation, it's known as the lukewarm church. The church that was neither hot nor cold. And if they didn't get either hot or cold, God, God was going to spew them out of his mouth. And so that's a great reminder to us to really be uh, hot or cold. If you have the option between hot or cold, be hot. If you're cold, that just means you're going to your destruction sooner. And without as much mess, maybe awesome, but it, it, this is just the simplicity of allowing God to be first in our lives. So, verse 1 of chapter 2, I'll read and you can follow along. Chapter 1, again, Paul's just mentioned about the preeminence of Jesus, just putting him first. And then he says, For I want you to know what a, a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have, as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's pretty good right there. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with per, per, persuasive words. For though I, I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and power. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that um, as we come, and go directly before you, Lord, as we stop our lives and just allow you access to our hearts. As we open the doors of the different areas in our lives, you love to come in and fill us and change us and give us wisdom. Lord, to do a work beyond anything that we ever imagined. And so, Lord, this, uh, this afternoon, this evening, as we're... Um, just coming before you in your word, we ask that you would open some doors up, Lord, that you'd knock on some doors that we might not have opened. Lord, that we would allow you to just pour out your wisdom and your goodness and your truth and your love. Lord, you'd set us free. And there's just nothing better than that. You came to set us free, that we'd be free indeed. And we're looking for you to do that in our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's pretty interesting that Paul says, man, I, I have this great conflict for you. And, and if you think about that, as a Christian, right, if you're a Christian here, if you're a Christian, you can raise your hand. Awesome. If you're a Christian, one of the things that you're supposed to have is a real concern for the things that God has a concern for, right? Real Christians, people that aren't lukewarm, that are hot, 
that you can tell them because they're about certain things that are just clearly different than the world's agenda. And I, I just love to see that. You can also see people that are just going absolutely after the world. They're cold. And they're about to discover some destruction, for sure. Because in this world, Satan is like a roaring lion going about the whole earth, seeking whom he may devour. You know how you get devoured by Satan? Open up some doors for him to your life. Head some directions that go against God's principles. Be cold, and you'll open up some doors, and sudden destruction will come in, and you will have another opportunity to go, you know, running my own life, not the best plan in the world. I should go to Jesus. He's got this freedom and this forgiveness and this purpose. And you know what else? He does miracles. And he comes in like a flood and changes my life. Does he fix every problem that I ever have? No, he does not. Well, ultimately he does. He lets me die and then allows me to stand before him in his righteousness, forgiven, where there's fullness of joy and life abundantly. Can't wait for that moment. But while I'm here, I have a business to be about. And Paul says to this group of people at this church at Colossae, listen, I have a conflict for you guys. I really want to see that you have the fruit of God's spirit in your life. I want to see that you have the certain principles that are reflected in a Christian's life that come from an intense personal intimate relationship with Jesus. And it's not the don't do this and don't do that. And we're, we'll talk about that directly. It's not a list of works. It's not stopping, you know, uh, I have an old joke that goes, uh, you know, um, I'm a Christian, so I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't go out with girls who do. And that's your rule for being a Christian. If that's your rule, then someplace... In the midst of chapter 2 and 3, you'll find yourself someone that doesn't have the Spirit of God in it, in them. That's become lukewarm. That's not on fire. Because that's never what the Lord does. The Lord has this awesome ability to make us men and women that love and enjoy the life that he's given us as we pour out our lives into theirs. Christianity is never supposed to be a self-improvement course. It's not, we're not supposed to be here to get better. I think really one of the, the biggest um, drawbacks for, for the thing that draws Christians backwards most often is being disappointed in their ability to do all the things that God's called them to do. You know, have you ever been there where you've just blown it? You've, you've been struggling with this sin, and you just go out and you blow it. And you just, you just feel so ashamed. I, and this is the thought that comes into your head. I can't believe I did that again. And right there, right at that point, Satan just owned you. Because what he got you to believe is you should be better than that. You, you need to work harder. You need to get up and read your Bibles, Bible three times longer than you did yesterday. And be in church five more times this next week. And you need to develop some massive calluses on your knees. Because, as a matter of fact, you just walk around on your knees all day long. And honestly, that's a design for disaster. It's never what the Lord has. He has something else for you. He has joy. He has uh, just a complete freedom from the works of the flesh. Doing things in your own strength. That's what God's trying to set us free from. So Paul comes in and he goes, man, I, I really do. I have this conflict for you. I want you to know that there is something that you need to have really set solidly inside of your head. So you may not have seen my face, he says in verse 2. You may not have seen me in the flesh, but I have some things that I want to encourage you in your heart. 
that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. So here's the deal. When you know that your father loves you so completely, he's forgiven you everything. When you blow it, when you're in that moment where you're going, I can't believe I did it again. Actually, I, I was sharing with a guy um, this week, and he just at that place where he's just struggling with just living the life that God's called him to it, and he had blown it in some ways. And so I, I began to share with him just the way that God brought me to a real knowledge of don't make it about me. And so this is about 26 years ago, down on 395 at the Denny's. I'm uh, meeting with Steve and another guy on Saturday mornings, and we're going through and um, uh, going through the book of Romans, actually, together. Just really, we're sitting down, we're, we're talking. It's just awesome time of fellowship every Saturday. Wouldn't miss it for the world. <clears throat> Growing, I'm getting, my doctrine is getting just sound. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm growing in fellowship with those guys. I, I just love all that God's doing in my life. And the, the week that um, had transpired before I got there on this particular Saturday, I'd blown it. I'd really struggled. And I got there, and, and the guys are all ready to just go in and talk about the book of Romans. And I come in, and I start going, man, I just bummed. Why, hey, what's wrong, Mitch? They say to me. I go, and I just really struggled this week. I, I really, I blew it in some areas. I just can't even believe I blew it. I just don't want to blow it like that anymore. And a uh, real faithful, gentle, loving friend, Steve. So you, you might guess this might not be as gentle as, looks at me and he goes, you know what your problem is? I, I went, what? Pride. Right, I just told you I'm the biggest jerk in here and I'm all bummed out because I'm such a loser. And he says to me kindly and lovingly, yeah, you just think you're better than you are. Oh, man, that, that's lousy. I, I have no place to go now. If I argue with him, I, it's because I'm prideful. <laughs> And the truth was, I was just bummed out because I really wanted to be better than I had been. Instead of just going to the Lord and doing the simplicity of, Lord, please forgive me. Brother Andrews puts it this way. Brother Andrews wrote a book in the 1600s and he, about practicing the presence of the Lord. And one, of the, one of the first things that he ever learned to say to the Lord on a daily basis was, Lord, here I am. And I'm just like I am, and I can't change me, and you need to do something with me. I'm, I'm coming to you just like I am, and you need to do something with me. And that's what Paul's really doing with this church at Colossae. He's going, listen, I, I get it. I, I get where you're at, and I know that God's been doing this work, and I know that you can just get in a place where you're not hot or cold, and you're just resting, and you don't have that intensity of need for the Lord, or you're, you're not aware of the intensity of need for the Lord. And I, I want to encourage you, that's not a good place to be. That's what he's telling the church, and obviously that's what he's telling us. There is in this place this encouragement that when you're filled with the knowledge of God's love, then you will have this real capacity to love on others. Being knit together in love. When you really experience the Lord's forgiveness, you can forgive just about anybody. You don't get all hyped up about, oh, somebody cut me off on the freeway. You don't get all freaked out because, you know, somebody at... At Christmas, I mean, at uh, Thanksgiving dinner, took the best piece of meat. And that happened to me, and I'm not very happy about it. Actually, I, I love cherry pie, and they always make the cherry pie because they only make the cherry pie because I request it. I, I told them, 
Thanksgiving will not be over unless there's a cherry pie. I will be back to your house. Doesn't matter. There will be a cherry pie. It has to happen for Thanksgiving. That's the rule. If you break that, then you'll see me visiting your house until there is one. So if you invite me for Thanksgiving, no, that's the rule. So we, we had the cherry pie, and I, uh, most years, there's half of it left, and I'm a happy camper. And this year, I look over, and there's the skinniest little tiny piece of cherry pie left. That's it. And if I was more spiritual, I would have left it for someone. I did not. And I was a little bitter it was so small. Honestly, all that, to, to, it's just an example of me, of us, being able to move beyond thinking about ourselves. As silly as those things are. Are you aware that your Lord has forgiven you so much? Are you resting, relying, and clinging to Jesus? Are you clinging to you did your things for him? Because that's where we're going later on in this chapter. And in chapter 3. It's, a, it's the worst place you can go. Because you'll end up being at the church at Laodicea. It, it's a scary, scary place. Actually, turn over there for a second. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 15. Actually, verse 14. <clears throat> And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. And I would wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and uh, anoint your eye with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. And this is a, a great reminder of what that looks like for us when we get to this place where we're relying on the past for our relationship with the Lord, our works for our relationship with the Lord, instead of just the Lord for our relationship with him. Who he is and what he's done for us. It knits our hearts together in love and it, it, and it brings this truth of all the riches of the fullness of assurance of understanding of the knowledge of the mystery of God. And all of that is a convoluted way to say that it brings you to this place where you have this full assurance that your Lord loves you and has forgiven you. You're supposed to know that today. You're not supposed to know in general. So, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have sinned today. I have. <laughs> I was going to make an inappropriate joke about my wife and having bruises. That is not true. <laughs> I've sinned today in just thought and deed. So, you know, Steve's message this morning was, you know, Jesus takes and sets this standard for us of not only not killing or sleeping around, but not thinking about it or having that motive inside of us. And, I, you know, it's, <clears throat> I've just become, i become very aware. I Seriously, the... The whole, um, oh, you know, Steve's teaching from it. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. Whew. Oh, almost lost that one. The whole Sermon on the Mount is incredibly convicting every time you go through it. Because it just takes you to, is that me or not? Am I in a place where those things are reflected out of my life because I'm so close to Jesus? Or am I in a place where I'm resting on the past or again my works or the people around me or the church I go to? 
Because those things, man, that's, that's not good. You need to be in a place where you have the full assurance. So today, I asked for forgiveness right before I came up here in my office. I'm just like, are we good, Lord? I'm just going to hit a knee here. Because honestly, right now as we speak, the Denver Broncos are playing. And if you guys know me at all, I'm a big Denver Broncos fan. And I'm studying. And you know what I want to check wonder how they're doing. And Kyle, being used to the devil, and he's also a Kansas City fan, he came into my office and go, how are they doing? Oh, thanks for asking. Oh, look. <laughs> but I just want to make sure Jesus is the first thing that I run to. And there's nothing wrong with looking at a football game. Matter of fact, later on we see you're supposed to be free to do that. But what I'm not free is... What I'm not free to do is to have my heart owned by anybody else, anything else but Jesus. And so I, I know as I was studying, there's moments where, seriously, I'm just, I really wanted to just look at the score. And, and instantly, this is how I felt. You are such a loser. I, really, I'm like, you can't be more mature than that. And then I went, Lord, I can't be any more mature than this. You need to forgive me. You need to help me. And then I was able to turn and just go to him and do the things that are important. And there was an action tied to my willingness to submit. And that's what God wants from all of us. An action tied to your willingness to submit. You know, in verse 3 it says, In whom are hidden, speaking of Jesus, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Really, how to live your life is all hidden in here. You have to really dig it out. When you've got saved, you know, um, me, and Mar me and Marcy didn't get saved till um, I was 28, she was 26. We'd lived pretty rowdy lives. And um, we recognized, man, what, we didn't do it so well. Okay, Lord, how do you do it? Now I had to go dig out how to be a dad. What does it look like to um, parent biblically? What do we do with our finances biblically? How do we glorify Jesus with our finances? We had to start digging that out. I started asking people and going to Bible studies and listening and got a Knaves Concordance, uh, uh, sorry, a Knaves talk talk couple. I'll try that again. Topical, Nave's Topical Bible. One of the best things that I ever got when I was a new believer. And you guys have access to one on instantly on 13 different awesome Christian websites out there or on a Bible app. And you go and you look and see what it says about raising children. It, there's a topic and there's about... 120 verses listed underneath there. In the old days, <laughs> I had to go, oh, it's in Proverbs 22. Actually, there isn't that many Proverbs. Never mind, Proverbs 10. Is, and I'd go, okay, I need to go. I'd turn my Bible, turn to Proverbs and look it up. And then I'd go back to the names and look at a verse and, and go, okay, I want to look, go look at that one. Go look it up and read it. And now you just click on it, and it comes up, and you can see what God has to say about any specific subject. How to be a godly husband, how to be a godly wife, how to have a godly marriage, how to be a godly worker, how to be someone that glorifies Jesus instead of glorifies self. That's all the wisdom. And so you got to dig it out. You don't trust somebody else to tell you. Um, one of the most godly guys I, I know did me an awesome favor. I saw his family, and I thought, man, now that guy's got it going. So I, I went to him, and um, I said, you know, I, I, I just want to short-circuit this whole thing. I can see that, that you are um, raising your family in a godly way. I want you to tell me all the secrets. And it, really, that's what I said. So give me the shortcuts. And he goes, Study the Bible. You're a jerk, I said. I already got that one. I, I got, no, tell me, a, tell me a shortcut to make sure I have godly children. 
And there's no shortcut. Because if this stuff isn't true to you, if God's spirit hasn't revealed the truth of it to you, it's never going to have the same meaning. If you don't dig it out yourself, this is between you and him, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wow, that's amazing. There is certainly a need for us to live in a manner that reflects the truth that God's asked us to um, live for. The truth. We're supposed to be telling the truth in love, right? And, you know, a great example is um, we get saved and my wife has been going to church for nine months before me. And then I get saved and we're having a discussion because we're having, you know, we're always looking in the Bible to try and find answers for how we're living our life. And we get in a conversation about the death penalty. And my wife was absolutely sure that God would never, ever have you kill anybody. That that's murder. Ten Commandments. And I went, I'm not sure that's right, because I sure like to hunt. So I had an opinion about it. And besides that, I think people, you know, I'm, I'm a guy. You kill somebody, all right, we're going to kill you. Sounds good to me. And then we went, and we had to figure out whether or not my opinion or her opinion was right, or if both of them were wrong. And really, neither one of them were exactly right. I was closer, just saying. But I watched my wife go to the Word, see what God has to say about how much he values life, and that the only reason that to take a life is to protect lives. But there is a reason to take a life. When people go so, so far, there's a reason to take a life because you're protecting other lives in the future. And you stand with what God has to say, not what the world has to say. Love that picture. That is so incredibly awesome. God is absolutely so much wiser than we are. Verse 4, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with per persuasive words. Um, you know, we'll deal with the persuasive words part uh, a little bit later in the chapter. I just want to talk about the um, principles of what we make sure are in our lives. Paul goes on to say, For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. There is a need to have this steadfastness of trusting and relying on Jesus. It changes how you approach things. Romans 12, 1 says this. It's one of my favorite verses. You need to just turn there for a second. You need to highlight it. You need to mark it. You need to, if you don't have a pencil, fold the page on your Bible. If you have your phone, then I don't, you know, break the screen so it's stuck there. Romans 12, 1 says this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's just awesome. God's absolutely in a place where he says, you can come to me and you can trust in me and, and allowing me to be the priority in your life is something that is reasonable. I, I have these awesome mercies. By the mercies of God, it's just reasonable that I am to present my body a living sacrifice. Man, how am I going to present my body a living sacrifice? So when you got saved, you probably did that, right? Right? I know for me, I absolutely, when I got saved, I'm sitting in my truck and I think, okay, uh, you get to run my life. If you give me forgiveness, you get to be the boss. And I presented my body a living sacrifice. You get to run it. Absolutely. This is what I knew. I'm probably going to have to not drink as much. And this whole cussing thing's got to slow way down. I, I knew it. 
I, I just knew that was right. That was something, one of the things that the Lord was going, well, so. And, and really, he just took me to that place where he goes, so, if you, you're going to follow me, there's some things that are going to disappear out of your life. Are you going to let me lead your life? Okay. And, and I really like beer. I really did. I really like to cuss. I could make my point violently. I was awesome at it, at least I thought. And God said, I want you to be a different guy. And will you allow that to be true in your life? Will you present your body a living sacrifice because of the mercies of God? Yeah, I did then. How about today? What's God asking you for? See, he, he is talking to us on a daily basis going, hey, I want that. Present your body a living sacrifice. That thing you're holding on to, that bitterness, that disappointment, that person, because you have to let them go. And you need to let them go today so I can fill you up. I can fill you with all the wisdom and goodness, the mercy, everything that's good. That's what God wants to do. So Paul is taking this group at Colossae down through this list of just making sure that their relationship with Jesus was fresh and new that day. And now we're reading it 2,000 years in, later, and we're looking at it and go, okay, this ought to be fresh and new. Verse 6 says, you therefore have received Christ Jesus, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Right? You've received him. You know, I, there's only one good thing about sin. And it makes me fall on my knees and ask for forgiveness. That's the only good thing about it. Now, the, the best thing is I can do that quicker and quicker before I go into depths of sin. Before I act out and, and just, um, I, I really don't, it's so cool. I don't know when the last time I cussed. I like that. I really, really like that. I don't know. And, but you know what? I thought about it. Actually, there was an event that happened within the last two weeks where I'm thinking, I would really like to cuss at you right now. Really, I'm like, I... I, oh, okay, sorry, Lord. And instantly, I'm, I'm, oh, sorry, Lord. Thank you, God, that I did not. And the word didn't even pop in my head. I just knew I wanted to cuss at the person. They needed to know how stupid they had been. And God was so faithful to bring me to a place where I'm on my knees going, sorry, Lord. I just don't want to start down that road. It was no less sin because Jesus says it's all the same. Tying into Steve's message this morning. It's, it's not less. It's just less to fix. Seriously, if you cuss at your husband or wife, you have like weeks to fix stuff. Maybe years. There's things that I've said to Marcy that I so would like to take back. I wish there was an erase button. Because I've, that those words come back and five years later and she says, Hey, you said, oh, <laughs> and she's really nice about it. It would be in some context of just talking about how things that we've done in the past, but I just know that was just a thing that hurt her, and she's forgiven me, and she acts like it, it's, it's forgiven and gone, and it is just awesome, but it still is something that it took a long time for the wounds to heal. For her I, and so I would rather have it in my head thinking about it than actually going out right doesn't that make sense and that's exactly what the Lord's doing you're not becoming less of a sinner you're just sinning less isn't that great you're not becoming less of a sinner you're just sinning less I'm just as much a sinner today as I've ever been maybe more so I actually know I'm a worse sinner than I thought. 
when I got saved, I thought, you know, well, yes, I, I, I drink and I cuss and I do all this stuff, and I'm a, I'm a jerk. You know, I, I know I need to get saved. I don't like looking at the guy in the mirror. The guy will lie and cheat and do whatever. And then I, I've been a Christian now 30 plus years, and I, I don't know the last time I lied. I don't know the last time I cussed. Awesome. What, I, I haven't drank in 30 plus years, whatever that is. And this is one I'm absolutely sure of. No one in this room beats me in sin. I need Jesus desperately today. If he doesn't forgive me, if he doesn't change me, I'm always going to be this way. That's what Paul's talking about here. Walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Key. Key. If you want the joy of your salvation, you that fullness of assurance, know this, there should be some thankfulness. So, you know, as we were uh, doing worship and Brandon was just talking about just recognizing that Jesus is here and how much he's forgiven you and, he, you know, running to him and just that real principle of, Lord, I have no other place to go. Just me and you. And as I get to that place in worship, man, I... I, I have some thankfulness. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And that's something you ought to be looking for on a daily basis. Don't go through days full of, uh, without joy, full of sorrow and heartache. Days have sorrow and heartache. They just do. But they shouldn't dominate your life. There's days that are worse than others, but there's always a joy in it. I, I do funerals all the time. And for those that lose a Christian husband, a, a Christian wife, there's, a, you know, had a, I've been at funerals where this couple have been married 40 and 50 years. Awesome marriage. Kids just love them. And every one of those that are like that, the husband or the wife goes, oh, the joy is they're not in pain anymore. The joy is they're with my Jesus. The joy is they're partying. And, you know, all I have to do is wait a little bit and I get to be there. Isn't that a great joy? It's not ha-ha joy, but it's joy. And that's exactly what's supposed to be happening. And then in verse 8, Paul goes on to say, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all the principality and power. So let's just deal with one thing quickly. Yeah, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father are all one. And when you see Jesus, you see them all. And when you see the Lord, you see them all. And when you see the Holy Spirit, you see them all. And they're three people, completely unique. How's that work? I will tell you the day after the rapture. I don't know how that works. It's beyond my capacity to understand. But right there is a trinity statement. One God and three people. How does, that, the, the, how does that make it so that I have this intelligent faith? Well, you know, when I first approached that, I was, I was in a place where I'm like, okay, I, don't, I do not want to believe blindly. I had come out of the Mormon church where they told me I was going to be a God and get my own planet and get to um, make spirit babies forever and do whatever I want, which would have not been a good planet to be on, just so you know. <laughs> but I believe blindly. They, they told me all kinds of stuff about what uh, the angel Moroni had done and with Joseph Smith and, 
And none of it was, there was never any backing to that. And when I came out of there, I did not want to have a faith that asked you to believe blindly. And so when you get to the Bible, there's some mysteries. And it says very clearly, there's certain things that are mysteries. One of them being God picks and you have to pick. And both are completely true. So God picks beforehand, and yet you have to pick. And when, you know, the, the picture is you, you come up to two doors. You're walking down through your life, and you come up to doors, and one says, I want Jesus, and one says, I don't want Jesus. And you go over to the door, and you open the door, and it says, you want Jesus. And you open it, and you look on the backside of that door, and it says, I, Jesus, picked Mitch on this day to follow me. Now, who picked, the Lord or me? Well, obviously the Lord picked, and obviously I picked. How does that work? The way it works is, again, God's multidimensional. I, I travel through four dimensions, height, width, depth, and I travel through time. Those are the four dimensions I can experience. God is outside of time. It means that it's not the same to him. So when he says he picked me, from the beginning of creation, yeah, he did, but it's not, he's not in time when he does that. So if I tell you, you know, God sees the beginning and he sees the end all at the same time, I've really messed that statement up because he's not in time when he's looking at it. Well, what is he? I don't know because I don't have a fifth dimension to be able to explain to you how that works. And so now I, I've come to a place where God's bigger than me I can explain that he's bigger than me. I can explain, explain that he has more dimensions than I do. And now I have an intelligent faith. There is a creator. He's got more dimensions than I am. And he's outside of time. And he's explaining to me that he picks and I also have to pick. And he'll tell me exactly how that works when he gives me the ability to experience the fifth or sixth or seventh dimension. Same thing with... Um, looking at the trinity it's a mystery so there are some things that are absolutely you're not able to fit god within the context or the confines sorry of our understanding he's bigger than that and if your god's not bigger than that then you probably don't have the right god right if god's not bigger than you if god doesn't know more than you then there's probably some issues. So I, as I got to that place where I actually realized, oh, he's just bigger than me, that was awesome. It just made me solid. I didn't have a blind faith. I had an intelligent faith. Now, having said that, let's go back to verse 8. Dealt with that. I told you we'd get to this. Paul says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. And there's always Christians. There's always someone in this world trying to get you to believe the lie of the devil. He's, there's always something trying to get you to be a better person. There's always something trying to go, you're, why would God want you? You're such a loser. There's philosophies and ideas about how life should go. And it just destroys lives. God's designed this certain ways. He knows how that works. You don't believe the lie. Oh, what, which one should I pick? I'll, I'll do one quickly. Yeah, a worldly philosophy. Um, oh, okay, I'll just do that. The world's philosophy is you deserve to be happy. That's the world's, you deserve to be happy, you deserve health care, you deserve, you deserve, you deserve just to be this healthy, happy individual that is recognized for their value and nobody even should ever say anything bad to you. That's what the world says. And we're, and you know what? Christians start believing that stuff all the time. They start trying to make themselves happy. They start thinking people owe them. That it's not fair. That things should be fair. And again, if you ever want what's fair, if you ever find, you're saying, find yourself saying, I want what's fair, then all I need you to do is go pay for every ticket that you've ever committed that you didn't get caught for. That's all. 
Every time you've run a red light, every time you've sped, every time, if you want what's fair, you just need to go get straight up. Just, that's a place to start. There might be a few other issues for you to take care of. People that want what's fair have not used their brain. They haven't thought about it. They haven't recognized what the real issues are. But that all leads to, I deserve. I deserve to be happy. If you ask a majority of people in our world, a majority of people, what kind of marriage do you deserve? And they will go, I deserve a happy one. And I do this in counseling all the time. I go, I deserve a horrible one and then to fry in hell for eternity. It's what I deserve. Well, that's, that's not good news. Well, the good news is Jesus doesn't want that for me. The good news is that Jesus has a different plan for me. But I can't find it through the world's philosophies. I find it through the Lord's plans for my life. He who seeks to find his life will lose his life. That's what happens. Don't listen to philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men. Don't do it. We, we live in an incredibly fallen world. You know, um, <laughs> I just read this. So, so incredible. Just how blind we've become. They actually wrote this article. <clears throat> November is No Shave November. Or, or I don't, but it's, uh, do you guys know what No Shave November is supposed to be about? What? I still couldn't hear you. Oh, it's supposed to be about men's health. I, I didn't know that. You don't shave in November, and it's just a reminder for men to get physical exams and do that. I never knew that. I just thought it was an excuse not to shave. But they wrote this article about it. So, so in the article, I, this is the first time I actually found out that that's what it was for. In the article, they said, we can't have No Shave November anymore. It's not fair. What about the guys that really can't grow very good beards? <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know who wrote that, but I really, uh, it was... It was one of those moments where, I'm so glad I don't curse anymore. <laughs> I would call you names for sure. That's ridiculous because, oh man, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because everybody deserves to be respected. Really? Now the Lord's given a value to every single person. He said that, your value is so great that there was no price he wouldn't pay for you. But honestly, when I look at, G I come to Jesus and I go, you paid for me, I don't get it, buddy. Seriously, I don't get why you do that. Yeah, I, I know that you say I'm value, valuable, and I know you said that I'm worth it, and I'm going to believe you. I don't, I don't see it. Mm-mm. There is no way I see why Jesus died for me on a cross. I don't see it. And yet he did. And that's where I find my value. Not in, oh, I'm such a good person and man, Jesus got to deal with me. And if that's where someone's at, they need to go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. They're lukewarm, because that's not the response that we're supposed to have as Christians. The response we're supposed to have is freedom, and oh, I got seven minutes. Do I dare get into this next part? Yes, because <laughs> this is good stuff. Paul goes on to say, listen, and really the title of this next section is just, it's not about legalism, it's about Christ. So Paul says, in him, 
you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. <clears throat> so one of the things that Jesus did on the cross, that he, he had a, um, a number of statements he made on the cross. One of them was, it's finished. To, to st Thank you. I can't speak. My lips are numb. <laughs> Slap them. The telestai. Thank you. Got it out. I, I, I was going to get there. I wasn't going to give up on that. I knew I could say it. And that word means it's finished. And it's a legal um, term. And anyone in those days would have recognized that's the term that you write across a debt, a bill. that. So they would make these contracts. You owe me. You have to pay me back so much. And when it was all paid back, that's the word that they would write across the bill. And, and what Paul's doing here is talking to this, this group of people and going, when you look at this, you see that Jesus paid for all of your sins and said it's completely done. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked down through time to today. And he knew every sin that you committed today. Every one you did this week. Everyone you did last year. So you look at, you know, just stop for a second and think about the sins that you committed this last year. Yeah, everybody shout them out. I'm kidding. <laughs> think about the worst one. And at that moment, 2,000 years ago, Jesus goes, it's finished. Paid in full. Done. When I come to Jesus with the sin that I've done today, it's Jesus has already paid for it, and I'm just coming and going, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm repenting, but it was paid for. I can't fix it. I can't do, make it any better. I can't be better. I can't work to be better. I can't do something that says, oh, I'm a better person. You know, Paul's dealing with circumcision here, and, and you know, for the Jews... It was a big deal. It was what set them apart. It was the cutting of the flesh, uh, literally. Cutting away of the flesh. And the Jews actually thought, man, you, we need, you need to do this, otherwise you're not really someone that follows the Lord. And the Lord goes, no, you know, I need you to see that this is different. Has the flesh of your heart been cut away? So when you got saved, absolutely, I'm telling you, it did. But today, did you allow there to be a difference in your life? The cutting away of the flesh. You know how my flesh disappears? Sorry, Lord. I'm going to love you and love some people around me. And it, all of a sudden, my heart's circumcised. And it's softened. I was talking to someone this week, and they were saying, you know, they've been struggling with a couple things, and so I've been talking to them, and I said, you know, I, I came to church this week, and I got there, and it was all I could do to get in the doors. Didn't even want to be there, because right? I just, I know what, who I am. I don't even want to be there. Then I got there, and then the worship started. And then somebody shook my hand, and then the message. And by the time I left, me and Jesus are like this. Now, would it have been better if he came in like that and got even closer? But that's what circumcision of the heart is about. Okay, Lord, sorry, I allowed stuff to get in the way. I need to make sure that I have a circumcised heart every single day. It has to be that way. You being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. 
having wiped out the handwriting of the requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And we will stop there. I will finish with this. You know, it's very, very cool as you go through this Colossians, as we finish this up, there's going to be some outward actions that happen because of the circumcision of your heart. And, and Paul talks about it in chapter 3 and 4, marriage and, and just loving God and putting off it, the works of the flesh, anger and wrath and all, this, all the stuff that you just don't want in your life. He goes, you come to the Lord and he's going to be putting that stuff off. Your heart will be circumcised. There you go. But more importantly, before you get to this place where you're allowing the specifics of your relationship with, Lord, with the Lord to be played out by letting him clean up your life, you have to make sure he's just your Lord. So as we pray, I, I'm going to pray and, and just do some business with him while we're praying here. Just make sure you've allowed him to circumcise your heart to free you. Make sure you've heard him say, it's paid in full. Love you. Go out and sin no more. <laughs> Go out and follow me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that it's never about us. It's always about you. Lord, I, I just ask for anyone and, and all of us, actually, Lord. We, we all need to be closer to you. And so, Lord, for those that have just been struggling, that you would just assure them right now that you've forgiven them. Lord, um, just pour in your Holy Spirit into their lives. God, for each of us, Lord, pour in your Spirit. Lord, we're sorry for um, just allowing our flesh to run certain parts. We surrender to you, Lord. We ask you to give us the joy of our salvation. And that as we leave here, that we just have a fresh awareness that you value us so much that there is no price you wouldn't pay. God, and as we go out here this week, that the thing that people would know about us is we have the joy of our Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.